So, I'm Jean Marie Gueno. I'm the director of the Kent School of Leadership, Leadership Program on Conflict Resolution. It's a mouthful. And uh, so happy and proud to uh, host that event uh, with Yasmin Ergas and uh, Margot Wallstrom, who are both, I'm sure, well known to you. Uh, I don't think, frankly, I could find a, a better person to have an informed conversation with uh, Margot Wallstrom than uh, Yasmin Ergas. Uh, first, she's the director <coughs> of the specialization on gender <coughs> and public policy. And she's deeply involved uh, in uh, many of Colombia's programs and uh, committees. Uh, she's the co-chair of the university's uh, Women's uh, uh, Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Council, is that right? Yes. And uh, she's also chair uh, of the International Network of Women and Gender in Global Affairs. And uh, uh, she's presently focusing on the impact of uh, liberal, of illiberal. <laughs> Uh, governments on uh, gender uh, policies, and, and we had a great conversation yesterday. She's also doing a lot of research and thinking on the implications of, how do I say, transnational world on uh, gender issues, including the legal uh, dimension of it. Mm -hmm. uh, Margot Watson has uh, occupied, uh, has been very senior position in her own country, Sweden, but also in the European Union. And then the United Nations, you covered all the uh, In the EU, uh, you were commissioner for the environment and, uh, and vice president, uh, first vice president of the commission. So we could have another meeting just talking about climate and environment where yeah, you, yeah. you did a lot of, uh, a lot of work. Uh, at the UN, uh, you were the first special representative on sexual violence in conflict. Uh, something very important for the UN to uh, tackle the issue uh, in a more I mean, forceful way than it used to. Mm. Uh, and then in your own country, I mean, you have had uh, several ministerial posts, but uh, I would single out the, I mean, your role as a foreign minister from uh, 2014 to 2019, because you, you really invented uh, feminist foreign policy, and then other countries uh, started copying you. Uh, <laughs> Well or not, I don't know, but uh, uh, certainly you were a trailblazer. And so uh, I think it's very timely to have this conversation today. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I'm not sure if you'd like to say a few opening remarks. I, I can just break, say but... how happy uh, I am to be here because this is uh, my favorite uh, thing in the world to meet with, uh, with young people and students and uh, to hear your views. And you are the kind of the antennas towards the future, where we are going uh, maybe better than anyone else. Um, and uh, I'm also proud to uh, be talking about the feminist foreign policy. I, I'm at the moment, I'm actually a, a, a guest in, in residence at the um, Roosevelt House at Hunter College. So I'm, I've been staying for three weeks and I will have another week to- We grabbed her to come to Colombia. Yes, <laughs> very good. And uh, we have met also Jean-Marie uh, uh, and, and me uh, since we have been talking about, we, we are both on the advisory mm -hmm. board on disarmament matters. So we look at uh, the militarization of the world and the role of nuclear weapons and, and all of that. But uh, this is of course a, a favorite uh, subject. I have also been meeting this morning and, and that could be a good start maybe, that something so outrageous is happening to mm -hmm. women and girls uh, right now in Afghanistan, where they are made invisible. The we have to make from Afghanistan. Yes. yes. No, thank you. Yeah. So the, the plan is to make them invisible. They are not allowed to to leave the, the house without uh, a male uh, a male accompanying them. They cannot go to schools, cannot go to school any longer. They cannot go to work. They are simply excluded from, of course, political participation. And we cannot allow this to happen. And, and if, if we do not stop it, this will also unfortunately spill over into, into other countries and into the, th the political thinking in, in other parts of the world. So this is, uh, this is something that we really have to 
So we have formed what we call a, a women's forum on Afghanistan. And we did that immediately after the, uh, uh, the, the US and the international community left uh, Afghanistan. So what is it now? So soon it will be two years ago, when the, one and a half years ago. And we, so we involved um, Afghan women and we build a bridge to also international women leaders from all over the world. So we uh, are also meeting in New York at the moment. So we have uh, four of our Afghan sisters uh, with us and, and then we uh, try to invite uh, different people, uh, ministers, uh, uh, those who are UN ambassadors, uh, also uh, UN people uh, overall to, to discuss what, what to do. So it, it can be an example of, of what a feminist foreign policy could be. I think it's a very good place to start. <laughs> so thank you for coming. And uh, it, it would be wonderful just to hear, could you just say your names and and one sentence. Sure, I'd be happy to start. My name is Olivia Grimberg, and I'm actually the coordinator for the Kent program. So very appreciative to have you. Everything today. which happens at Kent program, but, uh, <laughs> thanks to her. Thanks to her. Yes, yes. Well, my name is Magda Miller, and I'm actually Swedish. Um, and I am not studying human rights at Columbia, but energy and environment. So if you can touch on those issues for people. Great. Hi, I'm Julia. I'm from Brazil and we are to be uh, energy environment and development. Hmm. I'm Matt. I'm undergrad studying political science and human rights. And Alison, I'm studying international security policy and gender. I'm Alison, but I'm also not a graduate and I'm studying political science. Hmm. Hi, my name is Teresa. I'm from Germany and I'm studying um, economic and political development. Hi, my name is Josie. Uh, I study the Mountain International Affairs at SIPA and then concentrating on human rights and humanitarian policy, especially on quantitative analysis of the United Nations. Thank you. Um, Hi, I'm Megan. I'm an undergraduate studying human rights. Hi, my name is Ashley. I'm at SIPA, studying the Mountain Day and the Mountain Day of the personal interest is in gender, climate, policy, and security. So we have to happen in all of that. It's very Thank you. Hi, I'm Maria. Um, I'm also from Sweden. Uh, my family is from the Balkan. Uh, and I'm studying, I'm at the I'm at CIPA studying uh, getting my MBA and focusing on international security policy with a focus on cybersecurity. Excellent. And the back benches. <laughs> the back benches. I'm Lily and from India, and I'm uh, studying economic development, economic and political development mm -hmm. uh, with a specialization in mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Renan Monsades. I am a I'm doing my master's in international affairs, and I am concentrating on the economic and political development, and as well as on international organizations. Great. Hi, um, my name is Flo. I'm studying international security policy at the CIPA. Hi, I'm Emily Kishner. I'm actually studying national finance in the Speak up. I'm actually on from international finance and economic policy, but I'm thinking about that. Yeah, I'm. My name is Matthew. I'm an undergraduate uh, history major, um, as well. I, I'm also working part time currently on an article uh, that discusses feminist approaches to the history of nuclear weapons. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that as well. I'm Sabrina. I'm from Afghanistan. I am a research scholar here at the Salzman Institute. I am working on learnings from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Last subject. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. So wonderful mix of people from all over and different yeah. subjects and uh, perspectives. So that's that's great. So I have the honor of beginning this conversation and thank you very much for inviting me to, to do this. Thank you very much for being here with, with us today. I'm going to start by asking a few questions and then I hope that you will all jump in and that we really have, that it really will be a collective conversation. I, before I start though with my questions, I have a question. And that is, you mentioned, you said talking about Afghanistan, we cannot allow this situation to, we cannot allow this to happen. And, you know, I totally agree, but it's not so clear to me how we're going to change what happens. And in particular, 
I wonder, in a context in which, yes, we have more countries that are taking on a feminist perspective in foreign policy, but Sweden itself mm. has just said that it will not, has just mm. reversed itself to some extent. So I, I'm mm. curious to know how serious is that reversal. But in 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 this context, in which sovereignty has become such a major issue, in which um, there's so much sensitivity about how far you can push on human rights and on women's rights in particular, what is it concretely that can be done? Well, uh, this is exactly what we've been talking about, uh, of course, in, in our meetings. And very often the answer is follow the money. Also, the Taliban's are uh, dependent on money, getting money. So apparently they do trade. Uh, uh, they do both import and export with uh, other countries. They uh, actually have declared also that they have a lot of money at the moment. They have, have um, had successes in, in, in getting money uh, into, into the country. But uh, apparently they believe that it is for the UN to uh, keep people alive in the country, giving them food and the life-saving uh, sort of humanitarian assistance. And I think the international community must say, no, we will not do that until you have used your resources to feed your people. And uh, we also have to make sure that we put pressure on, uh, on the uh, neighboring countries and other partners uh, to uh, also listen to and engage with uh, with the women in Afghanistan. And we have to put money in the hands of women. Um, uh, and I think that th this, of course, will have to happen in, in stages, but to just accept that humanitarian and life-saving activities can happen in breach of basic humanitarian uh, principles, um, or that it will go only to men, uh, that, that is simply not, uh, not acceptable. So the, the kind of monitoring of, of what goes on already now, I think, must also happen. They have to be able to explain, does this money actually reach the people who need it the most? And we know that this cannot be done effectively if women uh, are not uh, engaged fully. So I think we must we must speak with a much louder voice. I think we have also written we wrote a, a letter to the Security Council uh, with the proposal that they should also make a visit to Afghanistan, um, and they, they should bring women with them, uh, Afghan women with them. They should make sure that they meet with the Afghan women when they are there. They should look at and, and scrutinize carefully what uh, the UN. Uh, presence in, in Afghanistan uh, means. So before talking about recognition, before talking about uh, anything else, they have to do uh, these, uh, these measures. Right? So um, um, I, I really think that the leverage we have come from the fact that they want sanctions to be lifted, they want recognition, they want money and support. And, and that's where we have to be very, very clear what the international community thinks. We're not there yet, but this is the message that we um, send to uh, everybody uh, we meet uh, at, at the moment. And the world is at a loss of knowing how to deal with the Taliban. Yes. But what, what we have been able to do so far is to magnify their position, to actually let them say what they want. But we have not been able to declare what our agenda is. <clears throat> And, and not to stand up also for, for the rights of, of women. There have been general declarations, including from actually, for the first time you can see there is unity uh, among the big big powers that even Iran and China and, and the US of course and other big, big powers have declared that they want the Taliban to roll back the edicts or uh, the de decrees that they have. And, um, announced when it comes to, to women's rights, but I don't know if they're willing to do something to make sure that that happens. They continue to to trade and pump money into uh, to the Taliban as well. That's where we are. So I, what I hear you saying is we have to use all our forms of leverage. Yes. And the question is, who can we persuade 
to do that? Well, uh, there are a number of occasions. I mean, first of all, there will be a discussion about the UNAMA, uh, the UN, man the mandate for the UN in, in Afghanistan. And we have to make sure that that mandate, mandate stays with both a, a human rights perspective and the humanitarian assistance uh, uh, element in it. Um, we have to engage with with all these uh, these governments and and make sure that the message is passed on to to them. I think the Americans will have and the U.S. will have a, a, the most important role here because most of the money also to the humanitarian assistance comes from the U.S. So, uh, and I think that now apparently there has been a six months trial period. Uh, for everything, and and it is um, directed towards having life-saving activities only, and 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 that means I really think that they have to put some kind of monitoring uh, mechanism in place to see what what it means. Because what if the money is just sort of skimmed off by by the Taliban, or that it goes only to to men? Uh, women cannot also see uh, male doctors, but they cannot themselves train as doctors either. So what, what will happen to women's health? And our friends from Afghanistan, I say we cannot, we can hardly call our uh, women colleagues in, in Afghanistan because they, they just cry. They don't see that there is any future for them. And you can imagine if you had a daughter that is supposed to start school and you know that she will never get to school, that, that she cannot be uh, educated or trained, or that the mothers cannot go to work. So this is simply, you know, every woman everywhere should say, you know, if this can happen to the women in Afghanistan, what kind of signal does that send? It seems to me that it's incredibly important to think about the Afghanistan case, yes. and especially what you're saying right now, because the strategy that you're proposing, which, you know, we have humanitarian colleagues here who are conflicted over the question of to give humanitarian assistance or not to give humanitarian assistance and how to, whether to use it as leverage and how to use it as leverage. But assuming that it does, it, it does work as a strategy, it's a strategy that puts the question of women's rights at the center of an international politics. And I'm not sure that that has ever happened in quite that way. No, but it has also never happened that a country has uh, before uh, denied uh, girls and women the right to uh, uh, to get an education, basic education, or go to work, uh, 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 as they have done in, in a very sort of general generalized uh, way. But what I think is, Marco, is that in part, this is a legacy, this is the expression of a legacy of strength mm -hmm. and also of your legacy or of your continuing uh, work, because the possibility of this conversation is the sign that, in fact, there is a legitimacy to being able to, to that there is a legitimacy to centering a foreign policy on issues that regard women. And... Mm -hmm. You know, in the past, we've had very repressive regimes that have been extremely repressive in, with regards to women. We could extend this to other countries today, not quite in the same way, but still, I mean, you know, we see terrible things happening. But it's what I want to focus on is that there's strengths for women and strengths for a women's agenda in the international political discourse today. And I think that that's directly related to the fact that you launched the idea of a feminist foreign policy that basically centers the question of gender equality. Um, well, thank very... you for saying that. I, I don't think, I mean, remember that women have been fighting so hard for, for so long and already uh, 23 years ago now, uh, there was uh, the resolution 1325 establishing that women and men have sort of different roles to, to, to play in both war and peace and, and so on, uh, recognizing the, the role of, of women in particular. So 
so and and women ha have fought so hard for every step uh, along the way so i think that um but but maybe this has since we have more than 10 countries following i think it has made some uh, <laughs> impression or impact at least but now it's it's a matter of what do we do with it what do we use it for it is i have never intended this to be kind of a catchphrase only and i also did i i have to say this because i know you might uh, ask me questions about this that I, I have never wanted it to be a discussion about identity politics. It, it was. It is not a debate about what kind of a feminist are you or what kind. It, it, was, it has never been about that. It has been about practical policies around these topics uh, or the parameters that I established that had to do with rights, with representation and resources, as you know. So I keep repeating that and. I was lucky because it's just my um, attraction to uh, alliteration and to work with the, how to communicate things. And I, I just, um, um, I can blame nobody else, but, but uh, it was my idea from the beginning to choose something that was also could not be misused. It is, it is about changing women's access to basic human rights and legal rights in every country. And that translated and it becomes a matter of can they go to school? Can they inherit? Can they inherit land or or you know um, can they start a company and can they vote? Can can they really truly enjoy all the legal opportunities that men have? Um, and then with the representation, it is as simply as why do we still have to insist that women should be at the table? It is not a given, not even in the peace negotiations that we've had recently. There were no women. In Yemen, we had to fight so hard. They came to, to Sweden because we invited uh, both sides uh, in the Yemen uh, conflict. And we said, we want you to bring women. You come to Sweden, you also have to make women part of your delegations. And they simply refused in the end. Uh, they brought a group of women as kind of advisors. And uh, so we had to live with that, but that was, of course, it is, you know, it's still such a long way. Or Tigray, uh, and uh, what ha has happened in Ethiopia, um, that, that this, they were not there at, at the table. And women and the, the reports about rape being used uh, in, in Tigray was one of the most prominent uh, reports from, from that conflict. But women were not there. So how could they report about what, what war meant to them? And it means that impunity can continue for these crimes. It is a major element of what happens when you exclude women. So we are still, it has to be about the, the, the practical things, the, the, the women, you don't have to give women a voice. We often say that women have a voice, but the thing is that nobody listens. So you have to listen to their voices. You have to bring their voices to the, to the table. And the third is, of, of course, resources that we have to get. So where does money go? And in this case, with Afghanistan, is really can we say that it is a humanitarian assistance if we cannot be sure that the money and the help actually goes to? They are still forming lines outside bakeries in in Afghanistan because they cannot find. It. Uh, and the Taliban insist that they that they uh, they have money. So why why do they think that the UN should pay for subsistence to to their citizens? No, I, well, yes, I I completely agree with you, and of course I agree that the, that the feminist foreign policy is a, a point of arrival of a long long struggle, and that and that thirteen twenty five marked a real. Yeah. Uh, turning point. So we said earlier that, um, well, I mentioned Sweden's apparent reversal on the question of a feminist foreign policy, but I want to ask you is how well established were the mm. principles mm. such that, in fact, this reversal maybe is not such that maybe may, many fundamental things have remained in place? 
I, I wasn't that surprised because I, I think the, I mean, the, the right wing parties in, in Sweden, they hated the fact that we used the expression of uh, a feminist foreign policy. And they've tried to make, make a mockery out of it and so on. At the same time, they must have, it has sort of become the, the benchmark or the, the reference point uh, for a long time uh, in the debate in, in Sweden that we said, all right, so you say you're you're pursuing a feminist foreign policy, so why haven't you done this and this and this? So it means that they, they referred back to to the concept uh, all the time, and it was important enough for them to actually mention this concretely as one of the first points that they, they said. And at the same time, they said, no, 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 we will continue to work for gender equality, but we will not use the, the term. So we will continue, the, the kind of content should continue, but, but not uh, to use that term. I think it's a missed opportunity because this has, this means that the first thing is it creates, um, to some it has a negative connotation. So they will ask, so what do you think about this or that? We interpret this this way. Is that, how should we look at it? It gives you a chance to define what is feminism and go back to the very basic uh, definition of feminism that you can find in Wikipedia or any and any, uh, what do you call it, dictionary, and you will see that it means that women and men should be given the same opportunities and, and possibilities and uh, obligations as, as well in, in society. And, um, and then it creates also uh, an accountability because you establish that concept and in the end it will mean that people will ask, so what is it that you want to deliver? What will be the results of this? And they will hold you accountable at the end of your mandate. They will say, so what became of all of this? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this was exactly what happened that, of course, some of the CFN diplomats would uh, really uh, sort of drop their jaws when, when this was announced. But, but very quickly, we had to turn it into something like the yearly action plans where we would define also what do we prioritize now. We appointed an ambassador with the uh, responsibility of keeping all of this together. We did uh, training, internal training. We also reported uh, to the parliament. We made sure that the mechanisms and the structure is there to, to build it from. And first and foremost, we asked our diplomats. So if, uh, and we provided them with, uh, with the parameters and we said, so what does this look like in the country where you are based, where you are posted? Uh, what about child marriages? Is that something that, that occurs? And, and can we do something about that? What about the support to women journalists in, in your country if they, women are to participate? What about helping uh, women to enter into politics, which we did in, in so many countries? So I think that most of this will, it will survive, uh, even if uh, uh, this government uh, will will not use the term feminist foreign policy. And now, uh, as I said, there is a network uh, of um, at least 10 countries, more countries have announced that they are planning to, to join. Uh, and to have that network with foreign ministers from all these countries, and they are not only small forgotten countries somewhere in the world, but they are, they are like big European countries and, and really it has traveled ar around the world. And to just say that we we are not interested in keeping that network, it's just saying that that is stupid, uh, if you ask me. Yeah. That, that is stupid, no, really. And of course, uh, our diplomats also say, well, what do we do now when Germany uh, sort of calls for countries who, uh, who have a, a feminist foreign policy to discuss what should be now the next steps? Um, but but it will only work if they use that network and that um, community of countries to also maybe focus them or uh, agree on on a, a couple of priorities and uh, and and, uh, and demonstrate that they can do it. And one of the things that that I'm proud of as well are these. Uh, um, are these networks of women mediators and negotiators. And we started that as well. And I, I think there are 
around 15 or maybe 17 now. And they have been deployed all over the world to help in, in conflict. So we, we no longer had to hear the argument that there are no women uh, negotiators. Yes, there are. And, and we have now similar networks uh, in other parts of the world as well. Well, you know, what Am I also in too long? Yeah, no, also... no, absolutely perfect, please. No, no. But one of the things that I, the messages I always try to communicate to our students is that no matter how bleak it looks outside, you know that we have a lot of strength because they're here and we can do the work that we're doing. And this is how institutions are built. And yes. I think that that's yes. exactly but you're describing that there are there have been the competences the competencies have been built up the institutions the networks the possibility of um mobilizing resources that then become can translate into resources for women in uh, in a variety of settings so let's say that you have well that this network is in that, that the network of countries with feminist foreign policies is effective and mm. able to mobilize beyond its own mm. boundaries, if you like, because there are more people who mm. can contribute to it. What would you think are the two or three primary issues that could be focused on? You said, you mentioned child marriage. Yeah. You know, child marriage is an issue in the United States. Mm. I don't know if you know that. Yeah, no, I know, I know. It's there's there are a lot of challenges. But I, I think that, um, of course, uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights is a, a very basic uh, issue. And but also something like, if what if all of these countries could say, we will, uh, as the situation is today, we will in particular help also women journalists, for example, or women uh, that work in, in culture or artists from Afghanistan. We agree that we will make provisions so that we can um, can welcome uh, those and, and offer them protection as it is now and, and the safe behavior, you know. So the examples, these countries have to choose themselves. And I don't think you have to make it too complicated, uh, but but actually does show the strength of countries who will give priorities to, to these issues also in their, in their foreign policy, or expand those networks of women mediators and, and uh, negotiators or, or focus on the substance issue. That's how I'm hoping that they will can, can use this uh, yeah. platform. So, um... So we're not going to talk about the question of what is feminism because you've defined it, but yeah. it is the case that the definitions of feminism have shifted quite a bit. And in, in this country, they're quite contested. Yeah. So but I, I I don't care that much about the, 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 the <laughs> I gathered definitions. That. I think it's a wonderful definition to say that women and men and whatever gender you 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 find yourself uh, comfortable with. You want to enjoy the same rights and, and obligations and opportunities in, in life. But that is not the main thing here. I think it's really about focusing on how do we do that? How do we ensure that, that people, whatever gender they are, can enjoy the, the same rights? And mm -hmm. as the situation is now, women are sort of generally discriminated against uh, in, in so many different ways. And, and that's the starting point. I really think we need to make, to make, to declare that it is inclusive. It is inclusive and, and, and that's important that these policies are designed to be inclusive. Um, but if I had chosen, I, I'll tell you honestly, if I had chosen to make it a matter of the definitions and made, made it a point of identity we would have hit the brick wall. It would never have taken off. We would have stopped there and, and it would go on still. And we could never be able to, to sort of establish a feminist foreign policy. But I really mean it. And I think Germany is doing, making an effort to also define it further, to make sure that it is inclusive. And I've never intended anything else 
but I did not want it to, to stop by sort of entering in a very toxic discussion about uh, uh, identity. It is, it is really about the rights and the representation of the research. That's, that's where we have to focus our attention. So that's how we, how we started. I just, I, 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 can I just say, I am I'm taken aback by, by the fact, I mean, we went for a short uh, uh, trip to Florida and, and with my friend. And, and the Santis is introducing, I mean, wants to ban books in libraries that, that um, explain, um, well, I, I don't think he wants any uh, education about sex or anything of, of that kind. And it will just bring more, more abortions, illegal abortions. It will just bring more misery to so many people if you don't even understand your, your own body or what you can, can and must do or cannot do. I mean, it's just so counterproductive and very, very dangerous. Yeah. Well, one of the questions, I mean, so I'm, I'm going to participate in a discussion very, so very soon about the effects on gender studies of bans like the ones that um, that DeSantis is proposing or, or has in fact affected. But let me ask you something else. I've just come right now from a, a class, a discussion with indigenous women leaders mm -hmm. from all over the world. And they raised the question of how can they and I want to ask you, how can foreign policies operate when there are so many women yeah. who live under the rule of their communitarian, yeah. of their of their community, community collectivities? You know that in many countries, the government delegates fundamental jurisdiction over issues regarding family, religion, children, often education, almost always a whole spate of women's rights, nationality, to either ethnic or religious communities. Mm -hmm. And so dealing with states for women who live under this kind of rule doesn't quite get to them, mm -hmm. you know? No, um, this, is, uh, this is always a, a challenge. How do you consult? How do you invite? How do you listen to uh, also these these groups and my, minorities in the country, and how do you include them? And this is what we've been discussing a lot, also with our Afghan friends, because it's not only a matter of the role of women, but also of my, minorities and and the um, uh, ethnic groups, uh, um, or the, the whole country is sort of divided and. And you have to make sure that you put pressure also for uh, a government to um, to include these uh, these groups. So, so that is absolutely a, a, a huge problem that they feel that they are never listened to. Yes. And, um, they feel they don't have access to the state. Hmm. That they have to that they're stopped from going to the state by their hmm. collectivities. Yeah, and I think we have. A, I I I am very self-critical because I also think that in Sweden we have not been able to listen uh, to the Sami people or involve them and engage them in the right way. We we still have a long way to go, uh, and and not only that, but they are really they are harassed. They they experience sort of violence, or when their reindeers are killed. I come from the very north of Sweden, and we live with neighbors who are. Or so many people, and they they explain things that I I wouldn't have thought occurred in, in 2023. But uh, but still, there is so much of ignorance and, and so much of, of hatred even uh, against the innocent people who are just trying to live their lives. And so this is a huge. Uh, so I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I would think I'd like to open it up. But the question is this. Do you, it, it has seemed to me that um, in the last decade or more, but in the last decade, we've seen a very strong illiberal push that has manifested itself, for example, in the CSW, which mm -hmm. I assume you'll attend, I'll attend the Commission on the Status of Women that's meeting 
starting next week in, at the UN and various other places where we saw a sort of emerging ge geopolitics of reaction against women's rights and gender rights more generally. Right? And we saw alliances uh, between Poland and Hungary and Russia and a series of countries that have been pushing forth the traditional values for gender. Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, do you, has in any case affected some of those alliances. It's not clear to me because Poland and Russia may not line up in the same way anymore. So my question to you is, what do you think will emerge in terms of the geopolitics of gender from the war in Ukraine? This is um, uh, the most relevant uh, question uh, right now also, because I, I, I dare to say that I uh, have missed uh, sort of the, the, the women in, because they are so good at Zelensky and his whole team and the government, they are so good at communicating with, with people. They are, they are excellent, but you rarely see uh, women by his side. I think he needs to, to put more women in the picture as well. I know they have, because I, I worked for five years, I worked very closely with, uh, with Ukraine and I visited many times and I got to know so many of these uh, amazing uh, Ukrainian women, uh, well-educated, uh, of course, totally capable of, of everything that comes uh, uh, in, in, a, in such a, a dire situation as they live in now as well. And, and again, you can see it so clearly what it means that the resolution 1325 acknowledged exactly this, that the role of women, they love their country as much as men. They also, uh, they also fight and they die for Ukraine, uh, but mo most of them will have to either leave with the children or if they stay, they often take care of those who are left, the elderly or the animals or, or children that are, are left behind and that, that become orphans, they have a very particular sort of role and experience in this war. And not only that, but they are also exposed to rape uh, and sexual violence as a, a method and the strategy from, from the Russians. Uh, or they end up being trafficked when they come to uh, cross the border and come to another country. These are very particular experiences that women have. And if they are not allowed into any peace process, and of course we hope that, that peace will come, we don't know when yet, but when peace will come and there will be peace negotiations, if women are left out, if they are not there as sort of the warring parties or the ones that, that carry weapons on, but they experience war in a, in a different way, they are not allowed to be there at the table, we will again miss an opportunity to follow up with the war crimes committed against women and, and to also bring all the solutions that they will come with, their experiences and solutions and knowledge will not be used in, in the peace to, to maintain peace in, in the country. And I think forever that, and that I saw that as a special representative on sexual violence in war and conflict. And this was really what led me to introduce a feminist foreign policy, because I could see that this was, these women are not victims only. They don't want to be defined only as victims, but they are the ones who want to be able to rule over their, to choose their own life, but the life of their families, the life of their, their villages where they live and their country. They are also those agents for, for change. And if they are never listened to, never heard, uh, impunity will continue uh, to rule, as, as I said before, and, and we will lose out when it comes to maintaining peace. And, and this can create a more long lasting peace. This is what we know about when women actually come to the table. They come with another perspective. In Colombia, the women said, do you think we can have peace if you don't sort out the land rights? Or, or you know, what do we do with the land? And that had not until then been uh, very much part of it. And they were the ones carrying pictures of their uh, 
the, the daughters uh, in particular that had been had disappeared or, or died. And they said, until we get justice for our children, we, we cannot have peace because there will never be peace then for women. It can be a form of peace, but not peace for women. And that is what happens when, when if they don't uh, manage the process right also in, in Ukraine. So I think already now, he should also make sure that there are women with him on, on the stage and uh, appear because they, uh, now today, of course, we have a very different situation also in the war situation because everybody can give live documentation. So also women do that. And, and they show their lives, so how it turned out in, in other countries. But but you need them also as a representative so of the country uh, as with all their capacities. So I think this is uh, what I hope will happen. Yes, well, last year we had here, as I, as I mentioned to you, a, uh, a panel in which there was also amongst other people the uh, the Ukrainian permanent representative, but also the Ukrainian minister for gender equality, who was very strongly present. And there was a view that a feminist foreign policy or a feminist perspective on the war was absolutely essential and that the women were mobilized and that the women were actually the ones who were providing the frontline services and so on and so forth. But it seems to me that there's been such a a relentless militarization of the conflict itself and of the discourse around the conflict. Of course. That it's been extremely hard to... So I said that that would be my last question, but I do have another one. <laughs> Yesterday, we had the pleasure of having a conversation with Professor Guénaud about the UN and uh, about the international community, including about states. And the, the role of in how states define themselves and define their constituencies and mobilize their constituencies. And what I hear somehow echoing in what you're saying is that actually states ought to get on with the business of recognizing mm -hmm. how much of an interest they have in women's equality and gender, particip gender equal participation. But to the extent to which we leave that out of the equation, or states leave that out of the equation, they themselves have a distorted, partial view of what their interests are. And therefore, when they come to the negotiating table, they don't really put uh, their own interests fully forward. Is, is that? I think the Nordic countries can be an example of this. I mean, we have had uh, sort of economic growth and successes. We've been able to create a kind of welfare societies. While women have also been uh, a, a major part of, of the labor market. Uh, and you need to make sure that there, is, there are also services for childcare and parental leave and all of those things. And I think we are examples of that. We can combine all of that <laughs> with being also successful uh, economically. And, and and social so yeah. so that is um, absolutely and I think the World Bank and all all other reports uh, they say the same thing uh, that countries that also provide economic opportunities to women they fare better they have a, a, a better uh, sort of future and um, and better results yes I mean Christine Lagarde famously right mm -hmm. put forward the the thesis that integrating women into the formal labor market might be the single biggest boost to GDP of advanced countries. Yeah, absolutely. But, but also there were, there, in the World Bank reports, uh, we have also seen that there are still, at least uh, a few years back, or when I was a foreign minister, I remember that report from the World Bank saying that there were more than 100 countries that still discriminated against women in the labor market. So there were so many jobs that women were not allowed to, to take. So for even France had some rules, and it had to do with sort of physical strength. We, we were laughing at that because it was like women would not be allowed to that <laughs> 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 but they, but they, they said that uh, 
uh, the, you you were not women would not be allowed to to carry more than five lift more than like five kilos. So we said like a small child, <laughs> <laughs> a very small <laughs> child. <laughs> so this was uh, uh, there's still so much more to do. So there is pure uh, discrimination against the women, but I think we are making progress on that. Right. So, so let me open it up for questions, conversation, comment. Yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm so nice to meet you. Thank you for sharing your, your experience. Um, on Wednesday, the um, government in Germany announced that they want to follow a feminist approach. And um, since then, there have been like huge discussions about you know why feminist um, foreign policy, why not value-based foreign policy, things like that. But I think the main argument is um, um, is trying to combine countries that want to say include um, women and them negotiating foreign policy with countries that don't want women to be visible and they just argued how would that work how would you work with them together if they they are not giving their women any representation just like they ran were against them so yeah i just wanted to hear yeah. your thoughts on that. well that worked well during five years <laughs> When I was a, a foreign minister, you, we were in contact. We were voted into the mm -hmm. uh, Security Council yeah. overwhelmingly uh, as well. So I think it is better to be clear with with wh where you have your values and what your values are. I mean, they're still there for this government as well. We, we, we uh, luckily we do have yeah. a lot a lot of broad consensus about the basic elements in. Uh, the Swedish security and, and foreign policy, which have to do with generous development uh, policies and uh, uh, multilateralism and you know all of those things where democracy. So better to stand for something because what I experienced was that, yes, of course, some would, would probably think, what is this, you know, going in the women's world. But when they came to me, they was they would ask, what does it mean? How do you explain it? What are you going to do? And, and uh, how is this interpreted? So there was more curiosity than, than kind of a, a opposition to, uh, to it. And, and um, I, but of course, it, this is always difficult, but you have to meet with everybody. You have a dialogue with all countries uh, around the world and you meet and you know this, you know that uh, that they have a different view on, on this or that. And we accept to agree to disagree on certain issues, but but I I thought it, it actually uh, it received respect because it was clear what we what we wanted. And in the end, they often came and said, all right, our country has now three women in the government. And we were very proud to, to announce that. So it, it sort of pushed also in that they had they thought they had to answer to it. To the question about what they're doing for women. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm curious more about the um, internal politics regarding women first and women's it, um, like the idea of a feminist foreign policy. Um, I think, you know, even like at SEPA, for instance, a lot of gender related events, you often see um, like a productive dominant audience is all women. Um, you don't really see that many men. So I'm curious, um, you know, when you were kind of first uh, trying to bring this to the table and make it a main uh, part of the uh, Swedish foreign policy, um, how were you able to convince men that this was an important thing to implement as like mm -hmm. main aspect of it? or? And or did you have like other women who you were able to build um, mm. like coalitions or alliances with um, to get that? Well, first I had to convince the the prime minister <laughs> in the new government that they, that he would accept that we announce this as as a, a part of our sort of foreign policy. Uh, and then, of course, the whole government had to demonstrate that we were not only, it was not for show, but we would have the sort of gender-based gender statistics that we would, uh, in our appointments and in, in all our policy, this had to sort of see through. It, had, it has to be integrated in everything we, we did, and we tried to follow that very closely. And also in the ministry. So we appointed more and more women also as ambassadors so that we could show that we had a better balance between uh, uh, men and women also being appointed uh, dip diplomats and ambassadors. 
so I, I think it has to do with credibility and um, and and so that it had to be sort of anchored within um, the party and the government and our coalition partner and and so on. So that that was a work that went on uh, constantly. But uh, but uh, you might have seen if you follow me on. Twitter, for example, if I see these pictures from important discussions being going on, I would always, you know, ask, so where are the women? Because you can find all of these pictures with only men talking about things that also concern women, and they make up half of the world's population. So how can you, not, how can you ignore them? So this, this is something that has to go on for a long time yet. I mean, it's recently come to my attention that it's not always the case, even here, that when we talk about, for example, the sustainable development goals, gender is considered a legitimate part of that, or an important part mm -hmm. of that discussion, whereas even the Secretary General said you can't realize any of those of the goals without mm -hmm. taking into account mm -hmm. gender. But so I would encourage you <laughs> to and other students to be vocal about what this act, how how we can actually translate a gender egalitarian perspective into practice. Um, but you're right because it goes also in the other direction that we we have to explain very often also to men that this this makes it better for everyone, also for the men. It's it's not a a given sum and well of course it's a power balance in the end but it's not it's like when you have another child and you have to say to the first child that when it's it's not that you will get less but you get more love to give also to the new sibling uh, and, and it's the same thing here that both men and women and and children gain so much from having a sound relationship a more equal relationship between men and women also in society as a whole but also in, in the family you know i mean uh, marco or not i come from <laughs> the deep mediterranean and i think that i know a lot of people who would not automatically and instinctively agree I know. But, I know, but, but, but i can be I, very I, persuasive I <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think <laughs> <laughs> I think um, the way that I've approached it has always been um, trying to find a way to say, uh, you know, like, for instance, women having more money benefits men too, um, or women having education obviously benefits like men and women of the next generation. I think it is obviously something that's been frustrating that um, I have to establish that, oh, it's good for everyone, and that's why you should care about women instead of it being like, oh, you should just inherently care that um, women should have these rights. But I think what from what I've seen so far, it has been most effective to, um, yeah, as you said, argue that it brings a lot of, um, you know, like rising tides, raise all boats. Um, it, it brings benefits to everyone, including men. You know, one of the elements in, in the, when we introduced uh, um, the feminist foreign policy, um, became more important than we first thought. And that had to do with, I could say, culture, or actually an exhibition that was sent around the world or to different embassies. That was called Swedish Dads. <clears throat> and it was a photo exhibition of, of Swedish dads, like, like my son, my only son, he has three children. And uh, these were pictures um, from the relation that men have with their children. And, and these newly uh, new dads and, and their small children. So they would um, they would be there with their uh, trolleys with the, with the, I don't know, they had the violin. That's what they're, 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 they're the stroller. The stroller, yeah. <laughs> the stroller with their kids and they would go and have a coffee together. They would be in the park. They would show how they read to their children and, and when they go to sleep and all of that. And it was like from their homes, from really just in everyday life. And this was um, a, a simple exhibition, photo exhibition, and it, it circulated around embassies around the world. And then the embassies invited uh, dads like in Ethiopia, they invited 
uh, dads to write to take pictures themselves and then write a, a story and they also made competitions so they would, would win a prize if they had the best photo and the best story and it was so amazing it was because the interest for this simple photo exhibition that exceeded any expectations so many people came and they were starting and it started a debate in a couple of countries where they <laughs> later on introduced the parental leave for, for fathers as well, uh, because they had never seen it that way and they had not sort of heard the, the stories that these uh, dads were. And it was so moving and it was just a fantastic, simple thing that also uh, affected the norm, because it's, it is also about establishing a norm and a normative thinking about how society could could look like if we arranged it differently and if it's also possible. So that was um, just one result that uh, uh, I think we underestimated how culture can also help to to influence our thinking about the different roles that men and women play and. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that um, because I, I feel like society would gain a lot in terms of culture, collaboration, and also maybe parental envy for those who want to. But I also hear that they, um, like men would have to give up a lot, like um, compete more for, for jobs, um, um, lose power, um, you know, so there are certain aspects which they would also lose. So I, um, what I hear in the conversation in Germany is like, yeah, we want them to have the same rights, but you know, we also don't want to. Give up them to give up. No, that has always been the. That's always been the the the, the fight over uh, parents. The sort of the power balance is yeah. is important in all of this for sure. Some will have to give up their seats if more women uh, enter politics. Absolutely. But I think also more men will see how much they win from, so much they gain from engaging more in, with their families, with their children, or using parental leave, and and how you, you sort of foster children together, and, uh, raise children together. Yes, um, that story really kind of sparked a curiosity in me about how you make people across the gender spectrum feel as if a feminist foreign policy represents them and represents their needs. And I, I completely understand and respect the initial aversion to making this about identity politics, because I hear your argument and I hear the way that it represents so much more than that. But I think that representing a young person in the United States where identity politics is a very large component of our political life and our daily life, honestly, mm -hmm. I hear too often from friends, my young know, community, that feminism doesn't necessarily represent those who fall out of the gender binary, or it doesn't necessarily take intersectional approaches and might leave women of color behind, for example. And so I'm wondering, one, how you sort of deal with those issues about people not feeling as if feminism as a concept represents their current needs, but also innovative ways like this photo exhibition mm. can communicate to people yeah. that they actually do fall into the scope of but, a feminist world. But that was interesting also because the photo exhibition also showed to, to uh, men. Exactly, so they, yeah. Uh, you right. know, so they, they were very different pictures of exactly that this is, uh, this is not only for uh, traditionally we think about uh, yeah. men and women it is not uh, exclusive it is meant to be inclusive because we focus on so what what are your rights mm -hmm. what is every every person's uh, basic human rights and i i think too often and and i think everything we can do to explain that and to get to get it through without sort of entering into uh, only a discussion about uh, identity politics, but but focus on again come back to the, the three R's, uh, the the better. And I I think Germany will definitely help us to do that because they have they have really invested in in making sure that we can explain mm -hmm. that. So that that would have been the next step also for me yeah. to show that it is inclusive. I think it's it, is, also it is it is all women. Right. Uh, it is all women or whatever gender you know that that we are dealing with the. Uh, imbalances and the discrimination. And mm -hmm. I think it is the discrimination that is 
is the worst. Um, but but you often end up talking just about a certain word or I also uh, went to Washington to hear the debate about the Equal Rights Amendment uh, and the fact that it has been a hundred years in the making in this country to, to have an amendment um, guaranteeing uh, sort of both women and men the same the same rights. Mm -hmm. But it all became a totally distorted uh, debate about the so what about men going to win the women's toilet or whatever? I mean, it was just, yeah. 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 That, that, so so I, I, I totally agree. And we have, to be, we have to be open to that. And we have to find all the ways to show that it is. Yeah, and, and I think how it, it, it calls for creative ways of approaching, explaining Absolutely. foreign policy to constituencies. Because I think there is this disconnect where simultaneously, governments don't necessarily assume that their constituents understand mm -hmm. the nuances of foreign policy, but also don't think of creative ways to actually engage people. But I do believe also that we have in practice, we've had this as one of our priorities, that we've had all our ambassadors all the, always walking in the first line in the pride parades mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, always uh, uh, initiating these type of, of projects, supporting these kind of, of projects as well uh, uh, at in in the different countries where where they are posted. So I think that you will find it has been uh, truly a part of of our policy and how we express it. So, but you're you're absolutely right. right. Yes, and um, yeah, go ahead. Okay. I kind of want to build up uh, the question that Teresa just mentioned. Uh, I'm quite curious when you said that. Uh, the the countries that you're working with, they're quite willing to make changes based on some of your uh, like advice, like add three more females in their government. I'm just also wondering uh, the reason why they will do that probably because they didn't realize it before, like they, they didn't have that mindset like before, and then you kind of share with them this kind of thought. So I'm also wondering what if the situation is different, and the reason why they don't have women in their administration is because of more deep roots issues, like maybe because the elite religious or like in China, for China, for our new newest uh, liberal study committees, all male, like for yeah. this this yeah. term. And this maybe because all of the she's confident, they're all like just happen to be guys. In this kind of scenarios, I don't know, like how would you like frame the story? And then, yeah. Yeah, no, but, but this is, uh, we, we, we know this, we are not forcing anybody else to, I, I never, imagine that, that even that those 10 countries would come along. It has never been an objective um, per se for, for us to have all other countries follow. But we wanted to, we wanted, of course, if possible to inspire others, but I wanted the, the, our own foreign policy to reflect this in reality. I wanted it to be sort of noticed that we uh, were pursuing such a, a policy. And then we know that it's very, very different from country to country. And there are all kinds of reasons. Often they, they say that it so happens that most are, are men, but the, the story is often that men choose men. When when they want to fill a, a committee or when they want to fill roles, they they often say, "Oh, we don't have any, we don't have any trained politicians, or we don't have any trained this or that." Um, and that can be true for for a while, but today very rarely uh, can we say that you can't find women enough to actually make sure that you change this balance between between the sexes. But I have never imposed this on, uh, on anyone. But instead, what we did with choosing a somewhat controversial uh, um, sort of title to it or name to it meant that you, people became curious, including um, now the ministers and, and, and they wanted to know more. And then we had to design it in such a way that we can that we can give results. You have like a story. I don't know what you like breaking the story because I feel uh, the, the way that people are trying to, uh, for example, in China, I feel uh, like females, their social status really rise up like in the 
1980s because of the reform and opening up. They want to they want to develop the economy. Then they need to include more female laborers in it. And that that's in time, Japan. They know yeah, that yeah. they have to have more more women then, also in the labor market. And being I feel because... the story they frame at that time is that uh, because we like women women they can bring economic uh, like benefits. But I, I wonder like when you're uh, trying to share this kind of idea to your like other foreign ministries what kind of stories you frame around this <laughs> I, well to me it is also a matter of democracy to me it's a matter of democracy as well women make up half of the world's population of course they would bring they would bring um they would bring not necessarily better things to the table they are better than men in general but they have a different story different experiences that they they bring with them how can any country say that no we will not explore the potential of half our, of our population they can stay home and and they, they are the ones who are women you stay home we do not even uh, spend uh, educational money on 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 you so how can they refrain from using the potential of Half of, of the world's population <laughs> to the full, and and that's sort of and also that women deserve the right to to fully participate in in society, and that's a matter of democracy. But but, but uh, I I will think about a story if you <laughs> if I do have a a story. Okay. Professor Gino wants to ask a question. No, it's it's triggered by this exchange. I think we have a very interesting question from our Chinese uh, students, and mm -hmm. uh, and you use the word uh, democracy because what is a world? And I completely agree. What is a world where half of the population would not be uh, included uh, in, in the discussion? Uh, but at the same time, I I wonder whether the the the, the struggle for uh, gender equality uh in a way if it's not better actually to not use the d word <laughs> which is uh which is a pretty divisive word uh in today's very polarized world and that to 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 go towards something that in the end certainly is democracy is better focusing on on gender equality is something that can help build the alliances across political systems that mm -hmm. Certainly don't have the same understanding of democracy, uh, so it's, it's uh, so I'm not sure I completely agree. When I maybe we agree, maybe we don't. But uh, it's a question. It's tactic and it's strategy yeah, on how but, but you approach I think that. I agree because often I say you don't have to call it the feminist foreign policy. You can call it whatever you like. You can say gender equality instead, or choose some something else. As long as you understand what it means, that you, as long as you define sort of the, the rights and, and possibilities for, for women as well, and that you are willing to fight discrimination, and that you are willing to listen to what they have to say. And also democracies, of course, uh, <laughs> because uh, in some countries that is not a, a given a value uh, or ambition for them. But you don't have to call it that. You can call it whatever you like, as long as you recognize the role of women for building peace. Because we cannot have sustainable peace anywhere. We cannot have meaningful peace processes unless women are part of it. And in Afghanistan one day, also women will have to be there to make it a rich country again, a country that can, can really prosper. You will need the, the women uh, in, in that. And that was my understanding from the beginning. It belongs to foreign policy because more women means more peace if they are there at the table as signatures uh, or on any peace deals, as peacekeepers and as peace builders when, when uh, peace comes. And we will see it in, in uh, hopefully also in Ukraine, that, that that is the role that we play. That's where it belongs there, but you can call it anything. I don't, I, <laughs> but I thought it was a good idea for us to introduce it <laughs> by choosing something that made a splash. Yeah. You can go value based, but nobody will care. They be known. Yeah. yeah, isn't everything value based? And what does that mean? So sometimes you have to lead by pushing the envelope. You know, I was going to ask you whether it was difficult for you to to label it and yourself 
as a feminist because precisely because of the kinds mm -hmm. of reactions. But now I understand that you you clearly and determinedly decided to face the reaction. Yeah. And I think that there's a major lesson to be learned there, which is it's it's not so good always to just fly under the radar, mm -hmm. right? No. Or to move to to disappear into the wallpaper. But I must say, I think we we have had for such a long time, at least for now 50 years, we've had a debate in my country about gender equality and reforms that, that allow women to participate in public life and political life. And I think most would say that they are feminists because they, they interpret it the way uh, I said that it is uh, defined. So, so most men would also say that they are feminists. They believe that women should have the same salary. They should have the same, you know, for the same type of work. They should enjoy the same rights in society. Uh, so, so that's. Um, but a lot has happened in just one generation. I think of my my father, and I now see my son, and the way the the, the roles for men have changed drastically. My father, yeah, I don't think he could make tea, uh, boil tea, <laughs> water for tea, you know, <laughs> boil an egg and something like that. Yeah. My father didn't have sugar in his coffee. So we didn't <laughs> <laughs> uh, from Afghanistan. I'm very happy that I came to this session uh, because, as you mentioned, we are currently the, in the worst situation of treating our women back home. Uh, I just want to, uh, maybe not a question, but just a thing that uh, needs to be considered in practicality. I'm a practitioner. I was an NGO, then currently I'm to government research, and most of the time I spend in rural Afghanistan working with each other. So uh, my mind was more focused on how can we make it work in Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, there are several layers of complexity in Afghanistan. It's two <clears throat> occupations in less than 30 years, yeah. the Soviet and then the international community military force. And uh, just the simple figures are so big, like the 10 years of the Soviet occupation, 2 million Afghans died. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, why am I bringing this uh, is that sometimes international community doesn't have time in a short notice that they have to go to Kabul or go to mm -hmm. Doha, talk to the Taliban regime. They don't have time to to go through the list who is in my team, who is not. I'll just give you an example. Two years ago, uh, our head of the uh, Human Rights Commission was appointed, this uh, fine lady, Sherzad Akbar. Yeah. Uh, during that time, I was in a, attending a meeting with the Taliban delegation who had come to Kabul mm. for prisoner swap. So I was representative of the government, meeting them in Serena Hotel, where they were staying. And there we talked about human rights, and this one Talib said, oh, your human rights. And he laughed with it. I said, why are you laughing? Hmm. He said, do you know who is head of the Human Rights Commission? I said, yes. And he says that, do you know what who her father was? I said, why should I care? Hmm. And then he said, no, her father was the person who killed my father. Uh, uh, his father was a member of the communist regime who was involved in many. Mm -hmm. And after that, when I went to her website, uh, Facebook page, she had these pictures with her father, who I think lives in Holland or Denmark somewhere. Mm -hmm. So this was such a sensitive issue for many mm -hmm. members of the Taliban who were coming from rural Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And their fathers and uncles were involved in uh, anti-Soviet uh, military uh, campaign. Uh, this I just brought as an example that when you said that we, we talked to Taliban and mm. pressurized them, we need to bring women to the table to talk to them or Afghan women. That is a very delicate thing to, mm. to take care of. And not, that's not only one thing. There are several others. For example, Taliban do recognize certain rights in under the uh, Islamic rights flag. Mm. Mm. That they consider yeah. that yes, religion that they think they're following 
is giving right so how are we going to use that thing yeah that already exists and their beliefs there will be a, such a uh, an invitation to discuss uh, exactly uh, so i just brought this that i'm actually uh, as a part of my work one thing is that uh, i'm currently working on is that how can we find ways of influence with the current regime yeah. uh, because if we don't do it in a positive way uh, the world is getting more polarized in the arena part of the world, which is uh, very easy to for other people like government of China or Russia or Iran to keep them at least for the next 20 years in power. Yeah, that would be a disaster for me. No, you're right. There is so much in history, you have to know something about history yeah. and, and uh, mm -hmm. understand how that influence also. And of course, everybody wants a dialogue. But it cannot be only on their con conditions. It is not uh, only for them to sort of set the, the agenda or interpret the, the results. And of course, if you, if you never want to listen to women, this is, this is difficult. So I think everybody's struggling to figure out also how to, how to have a, a proper dialogue with, with the Taliban. We cannot avoid that, but it has to be in certain so that's the problem that I was trying to ask in a way when I asked about geopolitics, right? Mm -hmm. Which is that unless you can have some kind of a consensus or some kind of an opinion in countries like Russia or China that are willing to support the Taliban because of their own geopolitical strategies, um, you're in a very difficult position. And so I think that the part of the issue from my point of view is that it seems to me, how can we ensure that a country like Russia or like China actually wants to play on the side of the people who are pushing for a better treatment of women in a country like Afghanistan, given all of the advantages that they could derive from going against the agenda of the other countries. That's I think, right, the, the big problem, that they can derive a lot of advantages from, and that they don't necessarily have a problem of dissent within their own countries to cope with, or not the same kind of dissent. They don't care that much about the, what the West thinks about them also, we have to realize. They, they don't like to feel that there is pressure from, mm. from the outside. And they they have said that clearly, yeah, so we don't care what, what what you are saying. And and of course, to to women who try to because we also the UN has sent uh, people to meet with the Taliban, and they don't want to look at them. They don't want to um, you know of, of course not shake their hands or do anything like that. But but clearly mark that you are not worth uh, as much as. Uh, Yes, yes. Yeah. So, and that's difficult for those who are in the delegation because they have to deal with that. You have to try to overcome and understand where that comes from and still, still be in the dialogue. We had an event here last year that was um, just when the Tal Taliban were announcing the, 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 yeah, the edict about women's education. And one of our guests was the former Minister of Education of Afghanistan, who had met with the Taliban and initially and is now in the United States, and had thought that maybe there could be some dialogue. And it and that event, which was a webinar, it was a mixed event, but that event, which was also a webinar, was hacked in the most brutal way. And since then, I don't have webinar discussions. It was not a webinar, it was on the web, but it was not a formal webinar. So people could mm -hmm. come in, even though we were screening them. It was hacked in a really horrible way. And for that reason, I no longer have web-based discussions of gender issues that are not webinars so that nobody can come in. But the brutality, of the uh, attack on, which was clearly related to the presence of the, of the education minister. 
was extraordinary, you know. And I think that it shows just the, the radical nature of, um, I'm not saying that it was representative of all the Taliban. I don't know who did it. I don't know anything. We were unable to trace the security breach. But it was a very uh, traumatizing event for all of our students who saw it. There is a book release uh, um, by uh, uh, Seyer Stad, the Norwegian, uh, the Swedes will know her. She, she lived for a long time in uh, Kabul. She wrote a, a very famous book that was called The Bookkeeper of Kabul. Mm -hmm. uh, and she followed sort of daily life and she, yeah, she told his story. And now she's written a new book. She went back to Kabul um, and also after the Taliban took over. And, and she managed to get into a family where one of these uh, Taliban fighters uh, lived and to interview him, actually, because I think she explained that she was writing a book and he tried to, to, to pre present also his story. And he had, I, I can't remember now, I, um, I haven't finished it yet, I'm still reading, but uh, she had um, also had uh, children and she spoke to one of the sons and I guess he was maybe 10 or 12 years old and she asked him questions uh, about how he saw life and, and the, the relations between, you know, what happened in the family and so on. And then uh, she um, heard um, the, the, the man, the fighter, the Taliban in, in the family that his son had said to him that he had spoken to her, the son had spoken to her, listened to her, tried to answer her questions, but his blood was boiling and he just waited to be able to kill her. Mm -hmm. So so that is, is how he had been raised, that, you know, they, you know a woman like that coming from another country, a white woman, was worth absolutely nothing. And uh, and he, he wanted to kill her. So then you understand how hatred can also be sort of uh, transmitted and and uh, further in in that way if you are of a very extreme extremist uh, belief um, and, um, and and no longer have to listen to anybody else because I think this is the and you you remember that book how to cure a fanatic. But it is not between religions. It is not between North and South. It is between the fanatics and the rest of us. Because the fanatic has all the answers, doesn't have to listen to anybody else, does not have to involve in a dialogue, has already all the, all the answers. And, and that makes it very a very difficult situation. And the fanatics, they have no sense of humor, also. They cannot uh, laugh at yeah. themselves yes. or the world. And I think that's one of the more prominent uh, features or characteristics of the fanatics. You don't have a sense of humor. What you say creates a real dilemma because, on, on the one hand, you say you must engage with people because otherwise they're going to live in their, oh. in their bubble and, it, and again, it's going to get worse and worse. And at the same time, with the Taliban, so how do we, mm. how do we engage uh, with them so that they're not just hearing themselves? Well, we understand that there there are also internal tensions uh, between groups of Taliban. So that there is a generation or a part of the, the Taliban rule where they actually, because they've sent some of their own children to places around Europe to, to study, or they have, they live a life that is very, very different. And they understand that particularly this uh, idea of not sending girls to school will, will not be good for them. Um, not as rulers and, and not in general in society. So we are hoping, of course, also to reach to, reach to those and, and reason with them. But, uh, um, you are, you're right in pointing to history also, we have to know. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> I, so, Professor, I will approach to you in on the matter of recognition the regime and how they work. I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. Like the question you asked them, mm -hmm. how to reach them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have two questions and then we really have to close it. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your insight. It's been a very interesting discussion, and I really appreciate 
like sharing all of your like personal experience in like how challenging it can be to advocate for a feminist foreign policy. Um, I was wondering how you like personally experienced engaging on the international level. Um, like in the past, I've also like um, engaged specifically with the United Nations and I was struck by, as a young woman, I've been like treated rather differently or perceived differently as compared to like my male counterparts. Um, and I was wondering whether there are any like challenges you want to highlight and then advice onto like how to deal with them. Mm -hmm. Um, because again, like I was like struck by mm -hmm. how different the um yeah, they're going to perceive to international affairs. And I'm sure there are a lot of other people in this room interested in like pursuing a career in like international diplomacy. So if there are any like if there are any insights mm -hmm. or challenges um or advice you want to share. If I think back, I, I guess I've experienced all of those things sort of in, in, in my career as, as well, including actually when I was a commissioner, I remember that very often we had visitors coming, like an often an old male group of uh, lobbyists of different kinds, and they would not look at me uh, at all, but they would look at my male uh, chef de cabinet uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and sort of address him. Um, and at the same time, when you are at a certain level, like foreign ministers, you have sort of established a role for yourself that, that carries a certain um, um, legitimacy and a certain, uh, what should I say, power that everybody knows exactly where you are on that level and they will address you from that point of view. But uh, um, but uh, I, I also once, uh, when I had these visitors coming and it was an all male group and I, I just asked them politely sort of may, are there also women in, in your your branch whatever it, it was and they were looking like lost at, it, at each other and then one of them said uh, we can bring our wives next time <laughs> not exactly what I meant but, but I think um I, I think it is it is a matter of where you are. I think people at the middle level are probably the most exposed because they're trying maybe to make a career or to and at the same time find sort of their their roles, uh, but they are also exposed to to discrimination or simply prejudice uh, very often. So and and I think there is so much violence against women, and, and that's another obstacle to everything that what women want to achieve. Because if you don't feel safe even at, at home, but you're exposed to, to violence, I, I think you it's so much more difficult. Um, yeah. and, and that's a phenomenon that we share. It's a global phenomenon everywhere. There is so much violence against women. And you can see it on Netflix, follow the Netflix series. It's almost always a, a woman being killed or several women being killed, not only, but they are like the the subjects of, of violence, unfortunately. You had a question. Oh yes, I just had a quick uh, comment, and I guess wanted to hear the, your perspective on, I would say, ways or how to use domestic policy best practices to share with uh, with countries that uh, that one country would cooperate, um, and. Just to illustrate a bit an example, so I used to work for um, the Minister Trudeau's administration, and one thing that we did domestically very well was that all cabinet ministers, mm -hmm. their staff, and the department staff had to go to a gender-based analysis uh, training. Mm -hmm. So every policy or every um, suggestion that we would then include in the in the government budget would have to have uh, a gender-based analysis. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I find a lot with uh, with feminist foreign policy is that sometimes it just gets cornered into international development uh, and just like really not going beyond into training uh, other government officials or departments and, and so on. So something I found with uh, sharing some of these domestic frameworks was that uh, in government, we would use the gender-based analysis into, let's say, trade agreements. Mm. So in a trade agreement with Chile that we renewed, we added a gender um, chapter in it. Uh, or when doing uh, budgets and when the finance minister will travel and 
get together with our finance managers, also put in the agenda, what do we think about adding a gender chapter into this or a gender lens into this? So I think that, that is something that from the Canadian foreign policy perspective has been very, very useful, but how can we find uh, ways of curious to hear your, your perspective on how to best share those domestic uh, practices and to adapt them into other developing countries? I think Trudeau has done it in a great way because he knows how to communicate. So he will sell it as a thing of, of his as well, or maybe it's thanks to you. But I, I truly believe it has to do with credibility. You have to make sure that this is also follows your, your internal uh, uh, policies. And, and that was true for us. And we've done very much the same um, uh, things that, that you are mentioning. So you have to, so this became the, the benchmark or the, the test case. So they would always say, well, if you have a feminist foreign policy, why don't you do this also at home? Or why don't you, why haven't you introduced this or that? So it became the, the, the yardstick to measure everything uh, against. And of course, very often you have to start in in relating uh, in relations to another country and with meeting them you say do you for example have a gender based uh, uh, budget do you can, are you capable of showing statistics do you have all the facts in how women and men um, sort of uh, fare economically and socially and in every way and that is not a given thing in, in particularly many countries that they have gender budgeting but, uh, but I think that's an instrument to just follow and see how, how it is going. Um, so so it's, it's a good example of uh, what, what we should do. And I, I think my country is, is doing it to a great uh, deal, but uh, could, could be sold better or marketed better. <laughs> It's time to wrap up. We could continue with our I'm sure. of question. I'm like on, 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 so publicizing data and how we can make progress by having more data because that's I mean what you you just said in a way, but how that could be systematized at the international level. So there are more gendered uh, data than uh, yeah. what we actually have at the moment. I could recommend if you wanted to hear, see more how how what has happened sort of to me, where well, there is actually a film called The Feminister. Uh, but I, I don't know where where to find it exactly, but uh, maybe you can look it up and, and see. Uh, so uh, it's a documentary. So uh, a filmmaker who followed me for four years. Uh, so he has documented some of the things that happened during the way. That would be great. Maybe we can organize a viewing of it. Yeah, 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 yeah maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I've been to some of these uh, viewings, you know, when they, it appeared on some film festival, so I followed the, the filmmaker there, and we had a debate afterwards. Very, very interesting. Well, I really want to thank you and thank Yasmin for what has been a really excellent discussion, where I think we went into the uh, all the nuance and complexities of uh, of your work or should be our work and i say that as a man <laughs> i think that it's it was an extremely useful uh conversation so thank you very much for taking the time to come all the way to Columbia. thank you thank you and good luck with uh, with your studies as i always said to new diplomats you need two things you need courage, because it will take a lot of courage uh, from you also as professionals. And you, you get courage from knowing, having a, developed a kind of inner compass, knowing what you, you, you know is right or wrong, to separate between those two things, and that will make you courageous. And secondly, you need some patience as well. Not too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be impatient also, but sometimes things take longer than we had thought, but it can still be worth it. I'm afraid, I think up and down will take a long time to change also, too. Yeah. yeah. Because we lost a lot of time, too. Um, and that's yeah. thanks to you also. Mm -hmm. I have good news from Italy, which is this year we elected, or indirectly elected, the first female prime minister, and she's a quasi, she comes from the fascist party. <laughs> but just recently, 
the democratic left elected its first leader, mm. and it's again a woman. So yeah. the two most yeah, significant right. politicians in Italy today are actually young women. But this progress, I mean, uh, it's it's huge it's progress. Are you joking? So progress. <laughs> so, so, all the same. <laughs> it's, I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.